My main text has to do with the evidence of illumination. Once a person's eyes have been opened to the truth, there's certain things that person's going to do to make that, that's going to make that known to others. And the thing mentioned in this passage is one of those things. He loves, the, he loves his brother. It's important to note that this passage is talking about evidence that we're in the light, not the source or the cause. This is not like how we get in the light. You know, like, you know, we've talked about like step programs. Well, if you want to get in the light, then the first thing you need to do is love your brother. That's not what John's talking about here. Yeah. It, it, like an action or a deed that like grants us access into the realm of illumination. The passage is not saying that God will begin to show us things or begin to favor us if we start to love God's people. This is talking about the result of being in the light, the fruit of it. Yeah. The love one has for his brother, that occurs after illumination has occurred. So like, let's start with this light, which Sister Mary started with. He abides in light. What is the light? Well, in this sense, light is like an, a realm or an environment that we dwell in. Now, that's like abide, stay. Some of the virgins, they would say it this way. It says he continues in the light. Like he's still making his will. One says he remains, like he's rooted. He's rooted here in this place. And another one says he lives in the light. Like that's his home. It's not like a visit or... Ex- or anything like that. This is where his permanent dwelling place is. It's a place where the Savior is the main focus and objective. In fact, Christ, he said he's the light of the world. In John chapter 8, I am the light. When reading this, we must understand that this realm or environment is a holy realm. It is one where God himself dwells. John, 1 John 1 says, if we, if we walk in light as he is in the light, he's there too. He's the source of the light. He is, the, he is light. God is light also. And in him is no darkness at all. With that being the case, nothing that is worldly or vile can be in this environment. This realm is only fit for those who are sanctified and washed from their former sins. It is a place where those who have their minds set on heavenly things, they're welcome in this place. It is a place where men are illuminated and can see spiritual things clearly. And it's indeed the scriptures say that God has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Meaning God's placed us where we are at. We did not arrive in this realm through personal achievements or goals, but by the grace of God. That's why we are in the light. When in the light, we do not stumble, nor do we fall. Rather, we make our way through this world in safety and with guidance from the Lord. Also note, this is not evidence that we were or used to be in the light. Rather, this is evidence that one remains in the light to this very day. And that he is not forsaken the right way. Well, now it's, it talks about, well, so what's one of the proofs? That someone is currently mm-hmm. in the light. Yeah. How are people to know that they're in this realm? Well, it says love your brother, which I think is very precise. It doesn't say love itself is the proof, even though he that loveth is born of God. That's not what it says. Rather, it's who you love that is the evidence. Yeah. Is it love your friends? Love your family? Love sinners? Is that the proof? Love your brother is the evidence. That someone is in the light, abiding in the light. But what exactly is that referring to? Anytime you get into commentaries, you sometimes get a lot of different results. And some have taken this to refer to like our neighbor or fellow man. They claim that it's our general acts of kindness toward all men that make it evident that we're in the light. And in a, in a small sense, that may be true. I'm sure you can build some kind of a case because this is a trait of man to show kindness to all. But I don't think that's what the Apostle John's talking about here. Not primarily. Such a love, I mean love toward all men, although a natural trait of a believer, is not the evidence mentioned in this text. Rather, I take this to mean that our abiding in the light is evidenced by our love and preference for the people of God. And it's sad on that note that so many professing believers fail to do what this passage is talking about. Damage that Babylon has done in the church people do not truly love God's people, which contradicts what they profess according to this passage. It seems odd these days for the average church member to have a preference or affection for the Lord's people and place them above all other kinds of company. Those who promote holiness and purity and godly living are often shunned and looked down on in the modern church. I'm sure many of you out there know what this is, know all about this. You're serious about the Lord, the less kindness you're treated with in Babylon. Those who prefer to be around those who love the Lord have even been accused of having no interest for the lost. Mm -hmm. Self-absorbed. You can't hang around church people all the time. I actually heard this in a pulpit. Now, you'll hear a lot today about loving sinners. You'll hear a lot about that. 
Don't listen for seconds on the radio. They won't see it. Yeah, love those sodomites. Love those drunkards. Love those fornicators. They'll talk all. They'll talk all day about this. But how much is actually said about how we treat the people of God? Very little. I listen to the Bible program all day. Never hardly hear this. And that bothers me. In fact, the ones that are serious about the Lord, the ones who want to live their lives righteously, are often the ones that are judged and ridiculed. I'm talking about in church now, they're like this. Such a sorrowful, unhappy, and low view of God's people did not have its origin in the light. Rather, such behavior toward the saints is evidence that one's shut off from the light. He doesn't love his brother, he abides in darkness, even till now. That's what the scriptures say about it. Those who do evil, it's, it says they hate the light. They're offended by it. You know, if someone's in darkness for a long, long period of time, someone turns the light on, they do this. Oh, they squint. Oh. And if they're cranking up, they turn that light off. It irritates them. They won't, and it's, they won't even come to it, unless their deeds be reproved. They're offended. Oh, they're going to see something that they, they're going to see something I don't want them to see. The world is said to hate us because it hated Christ. Righteousness and unrighteousness have no fellowship. Here's a good passage. Nail that down when we've read 2 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For we, ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So, what are we supposed to think when we see saints, serious saints, people who are children of light, being mistreated, shunned, looked down on, and beat up in the church? What are we supposed to think when reading this kind of thing? People who do this to God's people, they're not children of light. They don't, the, the fruit testifies of it. Spiritual Babylon has caused those in the professing church to be harsh and uncaring toward the people of God, tolerant of the wicked behavior of the ungodly. That's just what they produced. Well, let's talk about the good results now. Loving the brethren. Loving your brother means you're drawn to him, you care for him, you have his interests placed above your own, it means you prefer his company assistance over others, and also that you always are willing to help him if he's ever in need. One thing well, this shows us is that there's a unity and genuine fellowship in the body of Christ. They prefer one another. And this is the will of God that this be the case. I mean, Jesus did pray that his people would be one. John 17, 11, pray that they be one. That's talking about the body of Christ. And we're told that if we, believers, walk in the light of Jesus in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sins. Meaning that all, as we all partake of Christ, we shall resemble each other, loving the same God, sharing the same views, and living for the same ends. Of course, there will be much that is common between us, as there is now. Those of us who share this love for God, we have a lot of things in common. And hence, we have this fellowship with one another. I mean, you think of 1 Corinthians 12, where the saints they're referred to as a body. One unit, working together. Various members different functions, but they're all working together toward the same goal, the same purpose, in, harmo in, in harmony, too. That's, that's something you see. A body, like the human body, just in general, it's a very harmonious thing, a, a picture of harmony. Everything is different, but it all works together. Nothing works out of order. The body of Christ is such a unit, working together in harmony with the same mind and purpose. Whatever happens to one member affects the rest of the members. The scripture on this would be First. Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, it says, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. However, the text before us is not just speaking of agreement. It's bigger than that. It's speaking of loving, that's affection, preference for the people of God. And Jesus made known this command to his disciples. In John chapter 13, it says in verse 34, A new commandment I give to you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And that you love one another. Now, in the next verse, he makes known like how people would know that they are his disciples. Verse 35, And this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Amen. But this is not the only place you find a word like this. I mean, look at the Thessalonians, what Paul said about them in chapter 4, verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians. He says that they're 
taught of God to love one another. How about that? That's a, that's a thing that we once said about us. The apostle Peter, he spoke of loving one another with a pure heart fervently. Amen. That's in 1 Peter 1.22. The apostle John stated that if we love one another, that God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. In 1 John 4, verse 12, God is love. He that loves is born of God. So what are we, so what we're talking about here, it's not something the saints just strive to accomplish. Try, try to be nicer to the people of God. Try to be nicer to them. Try to bear with them. I know this is so hard. I mean, people talk like it is. The way they act testifies to this too. But this is just not the case. He's in the light, buys in the light, loves his brother. You don't love your brother, you're in darkness. It's just that cut and dry. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Rather, this is something the saints naturally do. I mean, like those who are children of light, naturally that's what they're going to be drawn to, the people of God, those who share, share in this blessing. Now at this point, there are various ways we show this love. I mean, this is the way of light. It manifests things. It makes things known. And so love, it's not just like, it's just not a profession or something that's just not obvious. Like if I told any of you I loved you, I'd hate for your response to be, really? You love me? Well, I didn't even know. Why didn't you say so? See, this is not... This, is, this isn't the way it should be. There's ways that we, things we do that make it obvious that we care for one another. And that's what, like, at this point of the message, things that I can think of that we show this love to one another in various ways. Now, there's certain text that says, do this one to another. These are the kind of passages I'm dealing with. First one being in Romans 12, verse 10. I'm going to go ahead and read this. Speaking of preference... Romans chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. That's the thing I want to focus on. Prefer one another. Meaning that every saint should view his brother in Christ as more worthy than himself and treat his brother with the most utmost respect and honor him. What is involved here, this is kind of like what was involved when the Spirit said, Submit yourselves one to another. To treat a brother in such a way is due to there being some kind of value placed on him. I mean, if you can see the Lord receives a person, that's going to cause any believer to value that person right. and esteem him highly. Amen. Skip a few chapters to chapter 15 of Romans. It says in verse 7, Therefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. There's another one. Receive one another. These are ways we manifest love to one another, meaning that we're welcome in each other's presence. This is not just allowing a person to stand before you. But this shows there's enjoyment and gladness to have the brother around. Any true believer will be quick to open his arms to one who shares in a love for the truth. It shows the idea of a brother like actually encouraging another to dwell with him. Come and meet with us. Come meet with us. Come dwell with us. Receive one another. The Lord Jesus didn't cast out those who came to him believing. Anyone comes to me believing, I will no wise cast out. Likewise, we don't reject those who are of the household of faith. Romans 15, 14. I myself am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. There's another one another text. Admonish one another. And Colossians 3, 16 also speaks of teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, which involves like warning or counsel. Indeed, those who truly care for the saints of God will be quick to warn them if they see them in danger. If a brother is beginning to slack in his labors for the kingdom, one who loves that brother will admonish him to labor with more effort and aggressively press toward the goal. When we hear the word, admonition, you hear warning, but it's also like urging the people to act on what they hear or act on what they know. That's also involved. When we hear a word, we admonish one another to urgently, or we urge people to act on the things that we hear. Yet another way we show love for one another. Galatians 5.13, another one of these passages, which says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. That's a very interesting thought. And this, this is similar to what was expressed in Romans 12.10, which has to do with placing the interest of others above your own. In this case, the brethren are placed above our own interests. Amen. Rather than seeking to pleasure ourselves, we think of ways to please our brothers and sisters in Christ, looking for opportunities to do things for them that would benefit them, willing to sacrifice time or anything else mm -hmm. to make sure that that gets accomplished. We serve one another because we love our brethren. 
bearing one another's burdens. That's another thing I could think of in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. There is mentioning of brethren that have been overtaken in a trespass or maybe have become entangled in sin and snared by the wicked one. As some believers who are weaker deal with temptations, they may wander into forbidden territory. I mean, it's sad to admit that, but sometimes this can happen. And those who are mature and stronger in the faith can assist them by helping bring them back to a place of safety and get their focus back in the right direction. That's like a ministry that we have one to another. Like those in Romans 15, 1, those are strong, we bear the infirmities of the weak. That's involved in that. Naturally, if one of the members goes astray, there's concern among the other members. In this particular case, this, the love for our brother is shown in the efforts made to restore him. Another example of this would be what the Apostle John said concerning a brother witnessing another brother sinning a sin that is not a death. It says, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not a death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin, for them that sin not unto death. So there a sin is witnessed and actions taken to resolve that situation. They know something terrible has happened. They're, they're trying to do something to help this fallen brother. That, to me, that's involved in loving your brother because you're not going to stand by and let things like this happen. You're going to make some kind of effort to keep them on the right path. Now, Ephesians 4, verse 2, we have another one another passage. It's forbearing one another. Indeed, not all the members of the body have the same function, nor do they have equal understanding on some of the things of God. In such a case, there needs to be forbearance while we grow together. Sometimes one who is mature and well-learned in the ways of God must be patient with the one who is still an infant in his understanding. In Romans 14, read of a case where a brother is weak or an infant in his faith, and he has a different understanding than one who is more mature. And it's like overeating meats. One eats meat, one eats herbs. But the Lord said to receive the one who is weak. And he tells us to receive, the one, to receive him because of that fact. I receive him, you receive him. The more... Those who are weaker grow in understanding, and then over time, understanding becomes more harmonious. I've seen this to be the case. Let them grow. And this type of behavior, I believe, is like an expression of love. You're not going to be overbearing on them. You're not going to place a stumbling block. You're going to, you're going to be patient. Ephesians 4.32 and Colossians 3.13 speak of forgiving one another, which is a form of love in the sense of doing good. And if any time a member of the body offends another, he is to repent of that offense, and the one offended must be ready to forgive. Because we love our brethren, we do not grudge against them or hold things to their charge or grow bitter toward them. Rather, we forgive them as Christ has forgiven us of our transgressions. Amen. First Thessalonians 4.18 and also chapter 5 verse 11 speak, Comfort one another. Comfort one another with these words. That's a popular one. Life in this world can be wearisome and grievous, and in times of distress, heartache, or discouragement, it's good to be able to receive comfort mm -hmm. from your brethren. Comfort is like consolation for those who are sorrowful or saddened. The design of it is to strengthen the one who's wearied or troubled. It is like the words spoken in Scripture. Why, why so downcast on my soul? Put your hope in God. It's like kind of like a word that, like, when in a downcast state, it kind of like brings you up, brings you up, raises you up to a more elevated state where you can see things bit better. And we show our love for our brethren by giving comfort to them when they're distressed or sorrowful, so that they can be strengthened. The last thing I have on this particular topic. It's also in First Thessalonians five eleven. So we edify one another. That's found there. Edification is something that brings true strength and satisfaction to the soul. The idea of it is to build up, yeah. add, strengthen. Being edified, it's being stronger. It's also being brought up higher. They're better off as a result of being around you. Mm -hmm. Things that you've said, things that you've done to them, this improves their spiritual condition. So when we gather together, we seek to edify and build up one another's faith so we can excel in our abilities. Of course, we, because we love the brethren, we desire to strengthen them and build them up. It's like something we aim to do each time we're around them. So these are just like some of the examples of what's involved in just like loving your brothers. It's seeking to do good to those who belong to the Lord have, and just having the, your preference for them. Now next, in the last part of the text, it says there's none occasion of stumbling in him. And boy, do the translations differ on this one. Now, just to show you an example here. Now, there's this. There's none occasion of stumbling in him. Here's just how a few of them read. There's none, nothing within him to cause him to stumble. He puts no hindrance in anyone's way. He is no hindrance to others. There is nothing to make him stumble. 
In the light, there's no pitfall, no fear of stumbling haunts it. Now, those are all, they all sound good, but they're giving two completely different ideas. One says, you don't stumble. No one says, you don't make other people stumble. So, which is correct? Well, I think they both are. And I feel that the King James renders it in such a way where both of those views fit. In him, there's no occasion for stumbling. There's no occasion for him to stumble. There's no occasion for anyone who witnesses him to stumble. See, both views fit in that rendering. I wish they would have just left that alone, but <laughs> they have to change it. So much for making it easier. So what makes people stumble is a lack of light, not being able to see where they're going. And if you, like one of the other brothers pointed out, you're in the dark, you know this is the case. What happens every few seconds when you're walking around in the dark? Oh! Oh! Every few seconds you're hitting something, you're running into this. Oh, is this the place I'm supposed to go? Oh, it's another wall. <laughs> Groping is the idea. Eyes closed, you have to do this. Yeah. And even then, half the time it's your legs finding things for you because you can't, yeah, because you're running into things so much. But people like this, they're in a constant state of confusion and distress because they can't find what they're looking for. They don't know where they're going. So there's nothing in them that offers direction, clarity, or benefit to others. Blind lead the blind. Into the ditch we go. But those who are in the light, they're actually called light. Call Ephesians 5, verse 8. Right. You're light in the Lord. Amen. You know, there's things like there's light in you. You're light. What it says, you are light. We're also said to shine as lights in the world. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. And in Philippians chapter 2, he said, he spoke about doing all things without murmuring and disputing. He said, you stand in a crooked and perverse nation. You shine as lights in the world among these people. We're even told in Romans 13, 12 to put on the armor of light. Yeah. Such a person who does this surely will not depart from the paths of virtue. They will not stumble because they see where they're going. Mm -hmm. Jesus said another word on that in John 11, verse 9. He says, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. So that principle is there. The path is seen clearly before them, so they're safe from falling or stumbling. But however, this is also true concerning our brothers and sisters in Christ. We do not set a stumbling block before them. And things like this can happen. This is there's a word, like kind of a word of warning against this in Romans 14, verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So, I mean, like, this, like I said, this can't happen. There has to be something said in order to prevent it. And it's sad to admit that this is lacking in the modern church. How many ministers have become discouraged and resigned from preaching due to just a disinterested congregation? Oh, the sermons are too long. We don't understand. How many believers have been offended because they, what they he come and hear in the congregation, it's not sound doctrine. Where's that found in the Bible? Excuse me, can you clarify that, please? I'm not reading that here. I mean, we, this, we're, how many people have come into the assembly desiring to be filled and they left starving? Mm -hmm. You go to a buffet and they give you a cup of water and they're like, this is all you get. Mm -hmm. You'd be upset, wouldn't you? Yeah. Your expectations are high. I'm expecting to get stuffed here. Yeah. There's a lot of room down here. I'll tell you what, you better give me something to eat. Yeah, <laughs> reminds, yeah it, it just reminds me of one man that came out to eat with us and... So the person was getting his meal bought for him. So he's looking at the menu. Everything that looked good to him was like expensive. And so he looked up and he said, are we going to be able to actually eat? Now, we don't want to do that when we come into the assembly of God. We want to come to a full spread table where there's plenty for everyone to eat and be able to eat until we're completely satisfied. But then again, how many of God's people have done what's right or like tried to stand up for what's right and they've been criticized for it? You shouldn't have done that. You were way too harsh. You should have been more loving. I mean, just to give some examples. But these are examples of believers having a stumbling block placed before them. The idea of a stumbling block is to hinder a believer from progressing. It makes it difficult for them to grow. and It puts them into a position where they constantly need to recover. They're worse off, and now they've got to gain ground back as a result of being around you. Stumbling block. If a person stumbles or falls, he has to get back up again. But from a spiritual perspective, getting back up again can often be take a lot of time yeah. it can be very difficult to do sometimes it's questionable if they can get up at all yeah. well don't we have a pastor who says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance you can only fall so far 
So then, if that's the case, if there's a point where you can fall and not get back up, don't make them fall. Amen. Don't make them fall. Those who love their brother will not make things difficult for them. Rather, they will enable them to gain ground and not lose it. They will help them and strengthen them so they can grow quickly. That's evidence that you're in a light. Now, there's an interesting connection here between Christ and his people. And here, I think it's really important we see that whatever a person thinks of God's people, that's what they think of Jesus Christ. Amen. However we treat God's people, we treat Christ the same way. If we despise God's people, we despise Jesus. Perhaps you can recall Saul of Tarsus when he was on the road to Damascus. And Jesus stopped him. And when he appeared to him, and this is the record here. Speaking of Saul, he fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou my people? Why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to pr kick against the pricks. So there's an example. Whatever you're doing to them, you're doing to Jesus Christ himself. Amen. So you can bring to remembrance the day of judgment where Christ tells the saved and the damned what they did or didn't do for him. And both crowds will ask, like, when did, when did we see you like this? When did we do this for you? When? And his response would be, as much these things you did unto these, my brethren, mm -hmm. you did it unto me. That's Matthew 25, 40, where he says that. You did it to my people. Mm -hmm. You did it to me. You did it right. You did good to them. You were doing good to me. You get credit for that. Treating Jesus with care yeah. and kindness. Mm -hmm. Or you treat harshly with them. That's how Jesus will view you. You dealt with me harshly, too. This shows how dangerous it is to treat the people of God poorly. For those who are, in fact, giving Christ the same treatment. This sheds some light on the text in Galatians 6.10, where it says, Do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. These people have God's favor on them. They're particularly dear to the Lord, so you really want to be careful not to offend them. Don't hurt them. Don't cause, don't cause them to decline or fall back. Rather, be a source of help to them. This shows that the people of God are particularly dear to us and have God's favor placed on them. Now, seeing that they're on the Lord's side, it's all the more important we do good to them. Mm -hmm. They're on the Lord's side. Amen. While the Lord does set rain on the just and the unjust alike and causes his sun to shine on the evil and the good, mm -hmm. he does have a people that are especially dear to him. And those people are very dear to each other as well. Just to close with just a little more involvement of the light here, because this is the rather than, you know, the love of the brethren isn't what gets you into light, but the light is the cause for the love. That's the thing you want to catch here. The result of being in a light is what produced this love you have for the brethren. The love of the brethren is like a confirmation or evidence that we've made some kind of transform transition. 1 John 3, 14, we know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. We know. It's like, well, if you're not sure, then, you know, no, no, you know this. That's right. It's an evidence for you. Being enlightened and become a servant of God, you have love for God, and his people are like him. So naturally, we're attracted to such people. If a person loves righteousness, then naturally they're going to be drawn to those who are righteous. If a person has a preference for purity, then they will take their company with those who are pure. We love our brethren because they're like God and they have qualities that are like our own. They sh we, like, we share. This is like the fellowship, the unity, the likeness that we share. There are many things in common between us that make us able to dwell together with peace and harmony. Yet another reason there that we love the people of God is because they're like the greatest benefit to us out of all the people. Since we're the light of the we are light in the world, we can help each other see the truth more clearly and help each other grow more strong in the Lord. You know, we have different levels of enlightenment. Some of us see things more clearly than others, but when we're together, things get clear, in other words. The result of being together, something's been opened up or expounded more, made more clear to me. That's my experience. That's one of the reasons we can love each other the way that we do is because we help one each other. We sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron, working together as one unit. In the light, people come to know the truth and understand it, and it's the light we know how to stay in God's favor. But it also helps you see who's in God's favor, too. Indeed, the children of God are shining lights in the world, and it is by God's Lord's illumination that we're able to see and detect who his people are. Mm -hmm. See, this is like one of the reasons why Babylon treats the people of God the way they do. They don't see God's favor on them. Uh -huh. They think they're, they're the ones that are in the wrong. 
they need to be treated as such. But if they really saw what the Lord said about his people and really could make that connection, what's said here, that's one of those people. Oh, I think this would really change things, but sadly, they just don't see it. They're blinded because they have not been illuminated. But because we are illuminated, we're able to see who the Lord's favor is placed on. I'm glad to be able to be able to see who the Lord's people are so that we can fellowship with them. Now, all of this is good to know, and it's good to know that we don't have to try to get each other to do these things. Start loving the brethren. Well, that's not the right tell you. If you don't, if you don't love the brethren, then the thing is like get in the light. That's what you tell them. <laughs> you don't tell people in the light to start loving your brother. If that sounds stupid to you, that's because it is. That's ridiculous. The, um, we naturally do good to the people of God because we're in the light and we see that the Lord's favor is on them. Well, those who hate their brother, they're in darkness right now and remain there. So what I'm going to exactly exhort you with here is to let brotherly love continue. Not start, not begin, continue. If you're in the light, then you're already doing this. And so the exhortation means, well, keep doing it then. Stay in the light. Don't depart from the light. Don't let the light get away. Because when you do, this fellowship ends. Those who will be your friends would then be your enemies if you were to depart from the light. And those who are your enemies would become your friends. We do not want this said about us. Rather, we want to be faithful to, one, to the Lord and to one another. Do not distance yourselves from the body of Christ and allow yourself to prefer the company of the condemned over those the Lord favors. Don't. I mean, you distance yourself, this is what will happen. Take your company with the people of God. You have the light, so let that light shine, brethren. Amen. And just know you can't lose when you're treating the Lord's people right. Amen.